Well, hey guys, my name is Jake Brom. I am the student and the outreach director up at our North Oakland Park campus. And I'm so excited today to continue our study in the book of Colossians uh, in the series called Walking Together. You know, I was thinking about uh, in my study of this book and how much is in it. You know, sometimes in my early years as a Christian, I would read through scripture and then get, try to go as fast as possible. And then I'd get to the end of my reading and be like, wait, what, what did I just read? Because I was just trying to get it done. And the more that I grow in my relationship with Jesus, the slower that I try to go through, uh, through scripture to better understand it, to better get my head wrapped around it. And in this particular book, I've had to do that uh, pretty intensely. Um, what I associated with here, uh, where I'm at my home in Kansas, uh, the grass really started to grow pretty intensely. It's the springtime. And so for the first time I cut my grass this spring and I tend to cut later than I should because I mowing the grass is not my favorite thing to do in the world. Uh, so when I finally got out there to cut my grass, it was long, it was thick, it was intense, and I had to go very, very slowly through thick grass. That's a lot like what the book of Colossians is. You have to go extremely slow to go through almost each and every, it was thick, it's intense, it is dense. There is a ton of richness in this scripture, in the, this Bible, and it is no different today. And so the question that we are answering today is what is the church? Feels like a pretty straightforward question, but I think we can get this confused sometimes. I think we can get uh, what our idea of church is or maybe what we were told when we were younger in our walk with Jesus, what church is versus what scripture defines it as. And that's what we're looking at in these verses today. But as we kind of jump into today, uh, I wanna pray and then start off with a story. So let me pray. God, we thank you for today. We're thankful for who you are, Lord. I pray that you would speak to those that would hear this message uh, and it, it would meet them where they are, that you would uh, prompt the Holy Spirit to, to challenge them uh, in a loving way. Uh, God, I pray uh, that the words that I speak are not my words, but that they would be yours, that your word would remain in them and my words would fall away and be completely forgotten. Uh, God, we love you. And we ask all these things in your name. Amen. So when I was in my uh, young 20s, I was living in the state of Florida. I uh, had moved away from home for the very first time. And when I was living there, I did a lot of renting rooms. I didn't have my own place. I just would rent a room for a couple of months and then find a new room to rent uh, because it was just really <laughs> expensive to live in South Florida. And I remember when I got my first apartment, I had taken everything that I, all of, all of my, my possessions, everything that I had, and I fit it into my, my white sedan, like some small beat up thing that I just threw all of my stuff into. Uh, and it was like a box of clothes. It was a small table. It was my bass guitar. It was an uh, amplifier that I had. And then all of my video games, like that was all of the stuff that I had value when I was in my young 20s, threw it in my car and moved into my new apartment. And what I discovered when I got there was like, I don't really have a whole lot of stuff. So I had to make do with what I had. And have you ever used something that was not, not for its intended purpose? So I was like, this is the best I have to work with. So I'm going to use this to, to get to what, what I need, right? So I did this with my, my, my amp, my bass guitar amp. And this was really one of the nicer things that I owned. Uh, it was a $500 amp and I was using it as a table. And you would walk into my house and be like, why are you using that clearly very expensive amplifier as a table? Because it was the best that I had. It wasn't what it was designed for. It's what I was using it for. Did it get the job done as a table? Absolutely. It was a great table. Are there better uses for that amp? Yes, 100%. Sometimes as we view the church, it can be a means to a specific end. How we think that it, what the design of the church is. Is it f meeting some of the needs that it is? Yes, sure. But is it what it was designed to do? Is it accomplishing why it was created? That is not always the case. And so what we're gonna do today is unpack that. 
We're going to dig into some scripture and see how uh, Paul's writing to us can apply and steps in the process that we can take. So if you have your Bibles, if you go online uh, to, to check out your scripture, jump in. We're going to be at the end of Colossians chapter one. We're going to be in six verses today. Six verses. And it's going to be in Colossians chapter one, verses 24 through 29. Okay. And our first point for today is this. Now, write this down. Uh, whenever I'm talking to students, I always say, hey, write this down now because there's anything special about what I'm about to say, but this is truth from scripture that applies to us and we can apply to our life. And here's our first point for today. We are one body called to minister in Christ. We are one body called to minister in Christ. This is verse 24 and it says this. I now rejoice in my suffering for you and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church. So this is Paul writing to the, the church, writing to those in Colossia. And he's saying to them, I am rejoicing, I am celebrating in my suffering for you. Now, Paul, inside of this moment, he is actually in prison. He's been put in prison for his faith. And so he's writing to this church that, hey, I'm going through it. I'm having a hard time uh, in in suffering and not being where I want to be, but I am rejoicing in it, rejoicing in my suffering and fill up in my flesh what is lacking, fill up in myself what is lacking and the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, his body being the church. What Paul is essentially saying inside of this is like, I am suffering, but because you as the body of Christ, as the church is benefiting, it's worth it to me. When I think about that, I think about a couple of things. One of my all-time favorite things, my favorite season, somebody asked me, what is your favorite season? And for me, it's summer for two reasons. Number one, I love warm weather because I really hate the cold weather. I'm really a wimp when it comes to cold weather. You, know, it's, you can keep the snow. I'm not a fan. I'll take sunburns and short weather all the time. Like that, that's my jam. The second is summer camp. Summer camp is one of my favorite, favorite seasons because it's an opportunity to take students out from their everyday rhythms and uh, r- remove them from their stressors, from uh, typical day-to-day frustrations, things that are going on in their life and get them into an environment that is fully Jesus focused. We're taking all the distractions away, all the things that sometimes pull us away from what God may be trying to say to us and take four or five days. And it is constantly about Jesus. And it is amazing to see the life change that happens within each of the students. It is amazing to see the relationships grow between students and adult leaders because of the hands-on one-on-one discipleship that is happening every day, all day, all the time at camp. And it is such a, a, a mile marker in so many students' faith. But here's the thing about camp. It's still time away from, as a leader, as an adult that goes, it's time away from your family. The worst part about camp is, actually, I'll back this up. The second worst part about going to camp is the four-hour bus ride through the state of Missouri, through hills and heat, on a school bus where the air conditioning doesn't always work, right? Second worst part. The worst part is actually the way going back home because the excitement and the thrill and the energy of going to camp is over. Now it's you're going home and you're more tired. You're more exhausted. You have sunburn and things hurt and it's sticky and you're uncomfortable and you are ready to sleep in your own bed. And I love the one-on-one discipleship with students. It is amazing to see the life change. But at the same time, you're living with hundreds of teenagers at the same time. That is not always my favorite thing to do, but it is so beneficial. But it is not my favorite thing sometimes to come back because of the suffering, because of the pain that can go through it. And it's a little bit of a silly, silly parallel to what Paul is going through, but there's a level of suffering that goes through it because God is using the suffering of the adults that go to camp or go to SBO, if you've volunteered at SBO or any kind of retreat 
to pour into and see what God is doing for the church overall. The other thing that I think about when it comes to this concept of suffering is this past year, my father passed away and it was completely uh, out of the blue. Didn't see it coming. There were no signs. I just got a phone call from my mother one morning and that my father had passed away. And it was one of the lowest moments of my life. It was pain. It was uh, confusion. It was frustration. It was a long list of emotions. But one of the amazing things that God has been able to do through the loss of my father, through the suffering of the passing of my dad, was my heart for those that have had their father pass away those that are going through the same pain that I experienced last summer that I now get to sit with and say, I get it, I can relate. I have a level of experience of, I know what I needed inside of that moment and then I can be that person for you on the other side of it. The suffering that Paul was going through was a benefit to the church. And so we have the opportunity to, when we go through suffering, and when I say when we go through suffering, to have that be a benefit to the church for ministry, for ministry. As we continue on in our reading in verse 25, Paul says, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God, which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. So of which I become a minister. That word minister, when it translates, if you don't know this, the Bible was not originally written in English. It was written in Greek for this section. And what that word minister translates to is servant, to be a servant. Imagine when you go to a restaurant and you have a server that is coming and taking care of the things that you need. And and if you need something, you're gonna go get it. They're gonna refill your drink. They're gonna bring out your food. They're gonna check on you. They're gonna see any kind of need that you have. They're going to take care of you through the entire meal and through the entire process. A minister inside of us is someone that actually serves and takes care of it. I became a minister according to the stewardship from God, the responsibility from God, which was given to me for you. So God gave Paul a responsibility for the church, for his listeners to fulfill the word of God, to do what God said he was going to do. We have a responsibility as the body, as the church to minister, to serve, to pour ourselves out, to go into suffering, to go into for the church. The reality is this, guys. For us to minister, it comes at a cost. Ministry comes at a cost. To serve comes at a cost. It's going to cost time. It's going to cost energy. It's going to cost brain power. And it's our responsibility to minister, to lean into that. I also think about, I recently got back from a mission trip from a country in, in Asia. And it is, is wildly different than it is in the United States. And I got the opportunity to uh, pour into missionaries from that area. And when I, I asked them the question of like, hey, why did you choose this country to come and serve? And, and, and my thinking, I was waiting for them. It's like, well, God just said one day, go to this country. And then we said, yes. And then we went. And that was kind of the end of it. But very rarely was that the case. Most of them said, I didn't choose this country. I didn't choose this location. I just said, God, I'm willing to go. I'm willing to be used. Send me wherever. And through a series of events, doors that had been opened after them committing to say yes, to be used by God, to serve, God led them to that area. I think sometimes we are waiting for a very specific go and do this from the Lord. When really, do we have this posture of saying, God, I want to be used. Regardless of what that looks like, as scary as that might feel to say, I want to serve God, send me. Where do you want me to serve and be used? Let's continue on. Our second point for today. We are one body 
seeing the mystery in Christ. We are one body seeing the mystery in Christ. This is verses 26 and 27. It says this, the mystery which has been hidden from ages, from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. Verse 27, to them, God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So in verse 26, it says, the mystery which God, the mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations. So this mystery, this, this understanding of what was going on in previous generations. See, in the Old Testament, there were all of these, these prophecies, all of these things that were going to happen, speaking of, of Jesus and the Christ and the resurrection and all these things that were going to happen. And the word mystery actually translates to a, a long kept secret. So that God had every plan to do, every intention to do that were, was kept secret to, to his people. But that now, as Paul is writing this, that mystery has been revealed. That secret is no longer kept. And who knows this secret? Well, his saints. And his saints being those that have a relationship with Jesus. Scripture calls believers, those that call themselves Christians as saints. So we know this mystery. I remember when I was probably uh, 10, 11, 12 years old and I had a habit of, of uh, trying to stay up. My goal was to do an all-nighter when I was younger. And so I would uh, try to stay up, try watching TV and I would end up falling asleep in bed and I'd wake up at you know, two, three o'clock in the morning. And the strangest thing was on TV, which is always a little bit of a dangerous statement, right? But I was, uh, so if you are anywhere older than me, they used to have music that you really wanted to listen to on these things called CDs. And they were small discs that you could get maybe an hour and a half worth of music onto. And as CDs started to become more and more popular, you had the ability to take the CD that you had, download all of the content on a computer and make a mix of different songs on that same CD. Well, the record companies figured out that that actually sold. People would buy those things and they would make compilations of popular music. And then once that happened within uh, the secular world, the Christians, uh, the Christian labels, I was like, let's do the same thing. So I woke up that ma- many times, I woke up that day to a infomercial about Wow Christian Hits. And that was an album of just 20 different Christian songs that were popular on the radio. And what I was watching was probably 15 seconds of each of these songs and video of people in worship. Video of people with their hands raised and eyes closed and in prayer and just a posture of worship. But to someone that had no context for Christianity, someone that had never been to church, was not raised in the church, I watched that and I was like, what is going on? I was confused. I was a little freaked out. I was like, what do they do? They look like crazy people. And there was so much confusion and mystery of what was happening because I had no knowledge and understanding of that. But now today, as a follower of Jesus, I get it. I fully understand what I was watching then. And now I'm one of those weird people. (laughs) I'm one of the ones that are like, yes, that posture of worship and celebrating and honoring what God has done on my behalf and his sacrifice for me, I get it. Verse 27, to them, God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of the mystery among the Gentiles. So the mystery that was revealed is made known. So think about this. This is the Jewish people, the Israelites. They have all of these prophecies of the coming Messiah, that it's going to happen. And there were two things inside of this context that absolutely radically transformed their view on this. Number one, that God's presence, the Messiah, would no longer live and reside in the ark. That would no longer live in a tent or a temple, but I would actually live in every single believer that lives inside of us. Mind blown. 
They were not ready for that. It was a mystery that they didn't even comprehend and understand. Second thing, was it the same mystery that they were promised, the same promises of God that they knew all through the Old Testament were offered to the Gentiles, were offered to those that that were not Jewish, those outside of the family, that same invitation was offered to them. Mind blown again. The mystery is made known as followers of Jesus. That mystery is made known to you and to I. Our third point for today. We are one body maturing in Christ. We are one body maturing in Christ. This is verses 28 and 29. Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ. Him we preach, him being Jesus, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, giving warnings and teaching and and, and revealing and explaining, helping to understand in all wisdom that every person, every man be made perfect, to be complete, lacking nothing. Verse 29, to this end, with that being the goal, to this end, I also labor, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. To this end, Paul, if this is the goal, I'm working, trying to get there. That's what, I'm goal, my, that's what my goal is but I am accomplishing that goal. I'm striving for that goal because of what God is doing in me. What God is doing in this mighty work that he's working in me, I'm trying to do that in others as well. Guys, we need to grow up. If you don't know, I have, I have three kids. I've got three daughters. They absolutely keep me on my toes and they're, they're seven, five, and three. And our house is chaotic and it's pink and it's awesome. But every year, we just had a birthday and every year that they grew up, they celebrate another birthday, their level of maturity is becoming very evident. Physically, they are taller, they, their hair has grown longer, how they choose to communicate, whether it was one word or two words at a time, now it's full sentences, now it's sentences with a, a different level of attitude or snarkiness that come with it. But their maturity is becoming very evident when it comes to physical things. And that is going to continue. Their physical maturity is going to continue whether they want it to or I want it to or their mom wants it to. That is going to happen one way or the other. But when it comes to spiritual maturity, that is a choice. Spiritual maturity happens with intentionality. It happens on purpose. And the reality, guys, you can be in a relationship with Jesus. You can be a follower of Jesus for decades and still be a spiritual infant. You can still be a spiritual infant. And I say that with love, but it's also hard truth sometimes. It's looking at a hard look in the mirror and saying, I need to grow up. As my kids are getting older, the behaviors and things that are doing, there's a level of expectation and what is and isn't okay. When my, when my kids were one years old, when they had to go to the bathroom, they had one option. That's why they all had diapers on. If my seven-year-old still had to go to the bathroom and was only using diapers, what's acceptable when she was one is not acceptable when she's seven. There would be a big problem. And it's like, there's something wrong with you still not knowing how to use the bathroom properly. We need to grow up. We need the hard truth of saying, we've got to grow up in our faith. As I was thinking through that, Another verse that kind of popped up that I was reminded of is Ephesians chapter four, verses 14 and 15. And it says this, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men, 
and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. We need to grow up. And we need people in our lives that will say, hey, you need to grow up. And communicating that in love. We use this phrase of raising kids when we have young kids that are in a house, preparing them for adulthood. But I think when it comes to that, when they become, when my girls grow up and become adults, it is my job to prepare them for that day. So it's less raising kids, but more raising adults. It is my responsibility to the best of my ability to prepare them to be adults who love Jesus, who, to, who have a benefit to the world, have a benefit to the church, who have characteristics that align with scripture. Like it is my responsibility as well as helping them understand how to do taxes and why insurance is important. Our responsibility is to raise each other in the church to do the same. And there's two of us that are listening to this teaching and you're one of two different camps. Either you are fully matured or you need to grow in maturity. And the way that we do that successfully is in relationship. Just hearing a teaching online or attending a church on a Sunday with nothing else is not going to be the fulfillment of maturity. It's, it's not going to be enough. I say that in love, but we are not created to simply attend church on Sunday or hear a teaching and that be the end of it. We have to be in relationship. We have to grow up together. We have to have somebody that leads to accountability in our lives. The reality is this. We need each other. And spiritual growth is going to cost you something. Just like maturity costs you something, spiritual growth is going to cost you something. It's going to cost you time. It's going to cost you energy. It's going to cost you brain power. It's going to cost you money. It's going to cost. But the question is, is it worth it to you? We are one body and we need each other to do that. I need people to say, hey, I see this in your life and we need to grow you in this. You need people in your life to do the same. So who's in your life? Do you have somebody that you are on their radar to say, I love you enough to tell you the hard truth so you can grow up, so you can be prepared for what's going to happen when the next thing happens in life, when the next thing happens in the political cycle, when the next thing happens in any kind of government or natural disaster, when the next thing happened and you know it's going to happen, we need to be prepared and have our foundation set and we need each other to do that. So for the church, for the body, for each other, are you willing to say yes to that? Are you willing to say yes to getting in a group, getting in a huddle, being known in in the church, in the way, in where you're sitting at, being known where you are versus just coasting through. We are one body and we need each other and we're the only body that we have. So will you say yes to pouring yourself out, to suffering for the sake of the church, to pouring out your wisdom and sharing your wisdom for those that need it, to having wisdom poured into you and sacrificing something to grow in maturity.